<sighs> Man, I don't know what kind of day you're having, but <laughs> I just can't see up from down and even my Bible's upside down. <laughs> You know, some days are like that. You just can't get winning for losing or losing for winning. And it's just been, oh well, Monday. <laughs> but you know, just like the song says, I can sing of your love forever. Uh, sometimes it makes me feel like dancing, you know. Just especially when my days go wrong as much as they go right. As a matter of fact, sometimes I enjoy more of the wrongness of it than I do the rightness of it. Now that's a hat of a different color. But no, seriously, it's like, well, you know, you try to get so much done and you're cruising along and, you know, you're running along and you're going, let's say you're a skier and you're going down slope or you're going cross country skiing, you know, and you're doing one of these sloshings things. Now see, I don't know what I'm doing because I've never gone skiing and I don't go cross country skiing. Personally, it looks like a lot of work. But anyway, you're going along, you know, and you're kind of doing one of these things, you know, and then suddenly you go, boom, and you run into a rock or a tree or a hole or a divot or something, and <laughs> you're discombobulated, you know, discomfited, you know, discontinued. <laughs> In other words, you're dissed. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but that's always perfect for me because those usually come on a day I'm learning James, you know, to count it all joy because I really enjoy those days. They kind of remind me that I'm not in control, that I'm no more in control than you are of the sun in its orbit. What do you have to do with the orbit of the sun? Nothing. <laughs> well, a lot of times that's what happens in life. No matter what you do, it's going to happen to you. Life is going to happen to you, period. That's the way it works. It's called life for a reason. And God gave us life when he breathed into us and we became a living soul. He does that at the moment of inception when God's created sperm and God's created ovum actually connect and they become connected together in a way that is beautiful in the timing of how it becomes one DNA strand. And it's all entwined and entwisted together the way that you should be when you finally find someone to be a part of your life. You should be entwined and entwisted, knit together in love, Colossians says. But when you do, you kind of like are like amazed at the intricacies of the detail of the ribonucleic acids as they become the deoxotribonucleic acids. Now that's for kind of like oxidizing something from the nucleic module. But as those chromosomes come together and as they join and as they find their fit spot together to become connected, then it's the beauty of that cellular life that when it begins to become enough to receive the breath of life, God breathes upon it. It becomes a living soul. And then you find the physical from the man, the emotional from the woman, and the soul from God. And they become one in the spirit so to speak, and it becomes God's beautiful creation. And it's wonderful when in some ways you realize that, that because God has breathed life into you, he's going to take you from that moment of inception to the conception of his holiness in you. He's going to conceive holiness in you. He's going to actually create in you a spirit. Wow, what an awesome thought that God is going to put holiness in you. Because we know you're one unholy dude <laughs> or woman. God knows, oh no, you know. But when he does, you become born again, not of the flesh, because that was already done when he breathed life into you in the first place. But then of his spirit, he brings upon you living water. Wow. And you become born again of a different dimension, of a different kingdom. And God calls that life eternal. And in that life eternal that he's given you, you suddenly become a new creation. And you're kind of like discovering not everything works right anymore. You've got like the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing. Well, the right hand's giving out and 
caring and dealing with people and helping, you know, the right hand of friendship, extending love, extending mercy. And your left hand is still kind of like the flesh, man. It's ready to hit someone. <laughs> so you have this war of the flesh and the war against the spirit and things just going bonkers. So you really don't know what to do. So you kind of find yourself going throughout the day going boing, and you turn yourself over to God because He is your Lord. He's your Savior. He's the one you've given your life over to. And God says, I got it. I know you can't see it. You're spinning your wheels. You know, you're in the sand just digging dirt and you're stuck in the mud. <laughs> Guess what? That snowbank ain't going nowhere. You aren't either because you're in it. <laughs> and you realize, oh well, what am I going to do? Die? <laughs> What's the worst thing that could happen to me? Go home to be in heaven. Oh, wow, what a terrible thought. So the joy comes in with the Spirit of God, like a rush of tide. When the tide comes in, guess what? You can't stop it. And when the tide goes out, you can't prevent it either. You can only control so much. And really, I got news for you. That little bit that you think you can control, you have absolutely no power over whatsoever. You are not in control. God is. He always has been. He always will be. That's one of the things that you learn in James, and you begin to learn it throughout the entire life that you live as a believer. You learn that you're no longer in control of your life, that you've given over your life to someone who said, I will take your life and give you my life instead. That I will take all that you've messed up in your head, and I'll give you something that's better instead. I'll give you eternity. I'll give you goodness. I'll give you mercy. I'll give you grace. Just give me all your violent actions. Give me your menial attitudes. Give me your carnality, and I'll give you my spirituality. And so the Lord gives us this beauty for ashes, because literally our flesh is that with which is dead and waiting to die. But the Spirit is one of life that reaches up and extends itself outward to the glory of God and wants to say, Come! Now! Lord Jesus, save us! Hoshana! Hosanna in the highest! Come and save us to the highest! and remove us from this world and make us humble unto you, O Lord our God. For hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and all thy strength. I love when James says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally, and it shall be given unto him. So whenever I go to James, when I've had a day like today, I go, Wow! Whoa! Huh! <laughs> I can look at James and be restored. I can cling to James and know that God is with me. We've looked at James from James 1 through 5 and we've been over it and over it and over it and over it and it just blows me away. It just makes me laugh. It makes me sing. It makes me shout because I realized in going slowly through it, we live it out. We live out what we say we're reading and living and doing and being because God is speaking to us. God is working on us. God is moving in us, both to do it to will and to accomplish of His good pleasure, not of our own, lest we be boastful and take it for ourselves and be selfish, but rather so that we would be His workmanship that's created for good works in Jesus to accomplish His purposes and not our own, so that we can rejoice in even the failures because they're His work, not ours. So that we can laugh and sing at the accomplishments because it's His glory and not our own. For it is to Him that we owe all our lives. And so we're looking at James. We're considering this book. We're identifying ourselves as being just one of the meek and moly and holy and just simple servants of God that really we don't know what we're doing. But we're just trying to do the best that we can. So we get by and we get through and we get to the Word and we ask God to help us. We ask God to anoint us. We ask God to give us an ability to understand things we might not understand. To give us that knowledge that we shouldn't have but He's going to give it to us anyways. We really want wisdom. And so God does and God has and He's heard us as we were talking. And so He's given you wisdom. So listen and hear what the Lord of the Lord would say to you as He encourages you in the day you've had. Because I'll tell you what, after the day I've had, whoo, 
I could use some good words. Gospel. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall be the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is that man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Whoa! I like being poor. I think it works for me. As a matter of fact, I think I like being broke. As a matter of fact, every time at this particular time of year, and I'll even give it away, Christmas, <laughs> I'm always broke. I'm always wealthy. I'm of low degree, so I can rejoice because I'm exalted. I'm ecstatic with joy because <laughs> I get a chance to appreciate so much more the wonders that God brings to me that are freely received and freely given the joys that God can bestow upon me because they're easily imbued upon me that I can easily release them unto other people. Oh, I am so refreshed in all that other people are so obsessed in the day and the date and the way they have to spend their money in these holidays and holy days and buy things for people when I celebrate the very fact that I'm alive the very beauty of grace that's bestowed upon me and the icicles and the monster icicles I got and the beauty of snow as it reminds me of grace oh I am so glad to be poor I have often said that there's a blessing to be of those who receive rather than those that give because I've received so much I owe every man so I don't worry about owing anybody anything I owe everybody everything <laughs> Debt? I got it. Hey, no problem. Payment? Well, we work on that. It's a chalked up to God's account. God says, I'll get it. And I say, okay, you got it, because, dude, I can't do it. And he says, I know. You never could. And you never would, and you never should. And so I feel sorry for those that are rich. Oh, woe unto you. Woe unto you. For you only have it for a short period of time. Even like I know that when I was making money and I made lots of money, gone like that. It's funny how quickly it disappears. It's amazing how you watch the sun when it comes out. The beauty and the glory of the radiance ball of light as it comes forth and it melts the snow. That's what your money's like. It means nothing. Your possessions are nothing. They don't have any accounting to God. He doesn't care about your money. <laughs> it does nothing for him at all. Whenever a man tells me that he's going to give once he gets, he's already lost the battle because he'll never get what he can give. You can only give what you don't got and then you get more because that's the way God's economy works. It's so beautiful. It comes down from heaven and it is easily entreated. It's like a word aptly spoken, almost as though it were an apple of gold in pictures of silver. It's perfect. It's mature. It's ripe. It's in its perfect place and it goes forth and accomplishes the will that God intended it to. And when you see it, you go, wow, that's awesome. It fits. It's perfect. When I go to the store with my wife, to the 99 cent store or the dollar stores, you know, and we, we go in and I laugh at her because she's always amazed by what she can't find. When she's with me, she finds. Or we go to the grocery store and we have such little amount of money so little amount that she's like discouraged because she likes to eat meat <laughs> she's a meat eater that woman is a meat and potatoes woman that's all i could say i'm not really into meat much i'll eat it you know if she cooks it i'll eat it you know basically put anything in front of me i'll eat it my name's mike give it to mikey he'll eat it and i do 
But you know, whenever she goes with me into the shopping areas, I had worked in a grocery store. I was a certified grocer, you know, I mean, a certified night manager with Safeway, you know, and so it's kind of like beautiful to see when I walk in, I know where everything's at, you know, and I go in these grocery stores because I've done recess and all that, and I know where they're going to put the discounted things. I know usually kind of when they're going to do it, but it's never knowing because the day that I go, God sends me out. And because he sends me out, I expect to be blessed on my going out, going away from the ministry. So because I set the ministry aside to go shopping, I always find these deals that are outrageous. She blows her mind over the things I do. I buy bread. Beautiful, wonderful bread. 20 cents. <laughs> it's like, and we freeze it until we need it. And we eat it and we never go bad with, you know, turning moldy bread. And it's quality bread. Sometimes it's expensive bread. And it's things that are just outrageous. 20 cents? Are you kidding me? <laughs> or I come home with these little creamers that she wants. Five of them! You know, they'll be like, I guess, $2 a piece or $3 a piece. I don't know, but you know, 29 cents, 39 cents, 49 cents. She's sick with what happens when I go shopping. <laughs> so let the poor rejoice that the man of low degree give voice to the things that God will do with him. Because God blesses us who are impoverished because we get the same as the rich man. Oh, I go out and buy a name brand from the used store. <laughs> You paid how much for that? Well, that was stupid. <laughs> I got that for two bucks, man. <laughs> Check it out. There's the label. <laughs> so I've learned that these things of the world that people consume themselves with are so stupid, so foolish, so unwise. Shouldn't we rather rejoice in the life that God has given us, in the beauty of holiness that he's restored us, if God has given you riches, then may I say to you, enjoy it, but employ it. Use it for the kingdom of God's sake, and then he won't call you rich. But woe unto you, rich man. For surely, as it says, the rich man in that he is made low, he should rejoice because he has to be made low. He has to lower himself and humble himself that God may in due season exalt him. But we who are impoverished and poor, all oh, that we own nothing, that we've sold everything for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Even as Jesus said, no man that hath given up house or home or family or friends or neighbors or all these things for the kingdom of God's sake shall not receive from the Lord. Oh God, we are blessed indeed. Have you never given up? Or are you always about buying a house, owning your possessions? Because let me tell you, the more you accumulate, the more you're weighed down. As a matter of fact, if it was a hot air balloon, how much do you think you could get off the ground when the rapture comes, when you own all these things that possess you and hold you down from where we're going, which is out of town? Man, I'm ready. Are you? Are you getting ready? Are you dispossessing yourself of your possessions? Or are they possessing you? Do you have to spend your time working on them, fixing them, cleaning them, doing them, getting them ready? Guess what? Jesus is coming. I am not into owning. As a matter of fact, Jesus even warned people about having kids in those days. I don't know about that, you know, because I don't think you're going to stop anybody from having kids because they, you know, they kind of like that kind of thing. But whoa, be careful. It is the last days and the Lord's coming is nigh. So rich man, I'd be very careful about your riches. And poor man, I'd be knowledgeable of the fact that though you're of low estate, don't seek to be made wealthy. Don't go after the things that profit you less but rather the things that will lift you up more to him. Make your dependency and your sufficiency of Jesus and he will give you miracles you would not believe. I am a living witness. I had a man talk to me and tell me that God does not do today what he did in the Old Testament and he does in the book of Acts. And I, saw, I looked at him and I wanted to hit him. It was the first time I ever wanted to just deck a pastor and drop him in his tracks. I was standing right next to him and I just thought, you know, I'd cold cock you right now and you'd be out cold. And you'd never understand why I hit you. What a bummer. Because, you know, you're just stupid. <laughs> you're just stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. And that's all I could think of was, how stupid can you be? And then he went and taught it in the church. And I thought, whoa. He's not only stupid, he's ignorant. Man, stupid and ignorant. Not a good combination for a pastor. <laughs> 
Boy, did I start praying for him to grow up quick. I hope he's grown up some more. Because the book of James would be one good place for him to start. Man, I just couldn't believe that somebody was dumb enough to be standing next to someone who lived in the Jesus movement with all the miracles of all the things, the people we laid hands on, the people that were restored, the people that had help were given back to them, the people that, well, I, I didn't raise any from the dead, but I know some people that did, and all the things that are going on even now in other countries, and he's telling me? Well, you know, it doesn't happen like that anymore. I wish the Holy Spirit had knocked him out. <laughs> That's a rich man that doesn't know his poverty. That's an ignorant man that doesn't know he's stupid. That's a man who needs to repent and find God. And the reason why he isn't growing is because he isn't knowing the Holy One of Israel. He has not encountered the Holy Spirit and walked into heaven and said, Wow, can I stay? Whoa, or can I take it with me? Let's bring heaven down to earth, as Paul did, as Jesus did, as John declared, as those with those that have good news are willing to share with all those who are willing to listen. God is with you. God is for you. God will restore you. God will bring you into that relationship where you can be Pentecostal, charismatic, just as nutsoid as you want to be crazy. Seriously. <laughs> What kind of idiot doesn't know that God does miracles today? Huh. Wow. I don't know. It just makes me dumbfounded to think that there's anybody that dumb that founded. <laughs> That's stupid. And yet James says right there as we began this teaching, as we began learning, as we started this segment, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men, all a L L, also known as let's see. A let's see A A L L. So all all is all. Gives to all men li liberally, and upbraideth not and shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. And you know, as I watched this man of God talk, I began to realize he didn't have any faith. He didn't, he's, he's, he's James 6. Not only that, he's James 7. Oh my God. Be still my heart. <laughs> he's stupid. <laughs> oh God, you're going to use him. <laughs> but you're going to abuse him to get him to where he can be used. Because nobody's that dumb. <laughs> Come on, Lord. Oh, I don't want to see this. Oh, no. Dum, da dum, dum. Dum, da dum, dum, dum. And now, 12 a.m., the man woke up in the middle of the night, and suddenly he had a fright, because guess what? Nothing was right, and he had to turn to God and trust in Him. Whoa! You see, you got to believe. you got to have faith. Nothing wavering. you got to go for it. Otherwise, you're just hedging your bets. I mean, if you've got some powerful ministry behind you, backing you up every move you make, you're not stepping out in faith. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. Or if you're like, oh, crying and whining and weeping and sheeping and, you know, kind of like leading and believing that you're leaving when you're really not and you haven't gotten a word from the Lord in since the day you got saved. Uh, I think it's time to get a word from the Lord. You're living off of everybody else's faith because you're washed whipped to and fro. First we'll do this, then we'll do that. My wife is here, my wife is there, my wife is gone, my man is there, my ear is there, my pastor is there, my father is there. What happened to the man that stood up and said, it's time. I die, yet I live. And Christ liveth in me. For the life that I now live, I live in the Son of God, who died for me and gave himself for me. Crucify yourself. Good God. Take the time to be alone with God and walk with God then you'll rejoice because he'll take away all your riches that you think you're wealthy. And I meet people like that all the time. They think they're so wealthy. God blesses them and they think, oh, well, let me step up into what God wants me to have. Uh, I don't know that God wants you to step up. He might want you to step down so that you could serve better. And I found more men of God stepping down and being used internationally 
than I ever found men stepping up and being used locally. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. He that exalts himself shall be humble, the Word of God says, because they're full of hot air. What do you think we should do? Hey, Pastor, how do we do this? Where can I get some knowledge? Who can I talk to? Where can I? And the balloon shoots all over the place because they're full of hot air. James 1 5, right here. Where should I go? What should I do? What do I do? Oh, no, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If any of you lack wisdom, let a mask of God do abrade his own men liberally. Okay, well, all right. I asked God, but I didn't get anything. But let him ask in faith. Oh, that was the problem. Yeah, you know, if I kind of admitted it, you know, if I kind of like admitted the fact that Jack, you know what, I really wasn't asking to find out the truth. I really wanted somebody to tell me what to do. I just wanted to get the position and not the problem. You see, because I like being in the position of being the authority. I kind of like having a suit and tie and saying the reasons why. I kind of like telling people what to do and kind of following through. You know, I like being kind of like, you know, well, I got saved, so I kind of love the people too, you know, along the way. You know, I like them, you know what I mean? I, I don't like them, but I love them, you know what I mean? I kind of got my theology down, or do I? A double-minded man is unstable in all its ways. I got news for you. If you can't find a man that's according to the word of God, living up to the word that said, don't follow him. Pray for him. Pray about him. Pray for him. Pray with him. Don't follow him. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all those ways. In everything that he does, in everything he says, and everywhere he goes, he will trip up on his own words. He will shoot off his mouth and show you what he's all about. He will fall into the pit of his own digging. He will cause many people to work for him. He will cause many things to happen around him. There'll be busyness, but no blessing. You see, if you're not enjoying the beauty of a trial, if you haven't encountered the wonder of dying, I have. If you haven't experienced the joy of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit in your own hands, praying for people or laying hands on them and seeing them change or anointing them and telling them they're in charge of things or that they're in leadership and lifting them up higher than you are, you're double-minded. You're making yourself out to be a god and you're wanting people to worship you. Oh, thou man. Oh, thou woman. Do you like being a speaker? Do you like being in front of people? Do you like doing the things because you get the praise and the glory the honor, even though you say it's for God. Do you know whether or not you are true, in fact, about what you say you're at? Only you, when you finally admit it to yourself, will be able to be stable. Only you, when you finally admit that you're fluffing stuff. Only when you admit, finally, that you really don't have it down and you're just as terrified as every other person and human being in this life, then God can use you. Because as long as you're making up these phony ideas of how you're supposed to be, you can never be the image of what God wants you to be. You can never stand before the people and say that you have the word of God and turn around and live your life a lie. Because you don't. Your words will betray you. Your life will be contrary to what your actions are. And the fact is, being double-minded it's pretty common nowadays. It says, let the brother of low degree rejoice that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Have you ever seen the flower of the grass? Think about that one for a while. There is no flower in grass. There are weeds, dandelions. You want to reconsider what you are. You want to be very careful about what you're reading. You want to re-examine yourself and humble yourself and ask God if in fact maybe you stepped out someplace you shouldn't be or doing something you shouldn't do. Because unless you step out in faith and fail miserably, you really won't know how to stand up in faith truthfully. Because there's nothing wrong with failing as long as you're truthful about it. There's nothing wrong in falling down and admitting you don't know what to do.
But the problem lies where if you don't go to God and ask Him what to do, what are you doing? What are you saying? Shut up. Be about the Lord's business in making you into what He wants you to be. Don't worry about everyone else because you're the one with the issue. You're the one with the problem. You need to ask God to lead you personally so that Jesus is the one in charge of your life. So that your Lordship isn't your church. Your Lordship isn't some man that you've married or some woman that you've gotten stuck with. It isn't about keeping a marriage together because you think you should. Your marriage is put together by God or it's not. And if it's not put together by God, you can stay in that marriage till you rot and God will destroy it and never honor it. Don't tell me that every marriage is made by God. No, it's not. There are lots of marriages made by man. And they are destroyed by God sooner or later in time. But the what God has joined together, let no man take asunder. Because no man can. Because God has brought the two together as one. Man may try, but man will return. And so, a lot of what happens in the world, and as we see these latter days coming to an end, is foolishness, stupidity, dumb, it's ignorance according to the Word of God. Because when you see somebody that's double-minded, they may be struggling, but if they can admit they're struggling, they're there, they've won the battle. Because they don't know, but they're struggling to know. Because they're reaching out and clinging to the only one they can know, and that's Jesus. Because if it isn't talked about and lived about Jesus, there's nothing about the gospel and salvation that's going to help you. Because they're just saying the words and they've got no power behind them. There's no meaning to the life that they've been given until they humble themselves and become that brother of low estate. Because even as the grass that flowers, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perishes, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. When you see weeds that have a beautiful face, when someone can put a good face on it, it looks great. They look wonderful. The perfect wife, the perfect life, the one kid, one, one boy, one girl, the two-car garage, the wealthy job, the prosperity teaching or the prosperity itself. Oh, the grace is taught too. But when the smiles are gone, when it gets rough, it gets tough, who did it? You did it. He did it. She did it. They did it. It's their fault. It's his fault. Oh, why did they fail? Why did they dry up? How did they no longer be a part of that place they said they would be forever and ever and ever and ever. I know because I've worked with a pastor, pastor in a ministry that said, I am here by the word and the will of God because God said he wants me here and I'll be here until the Lord returns. I thought about that and I said, oh, no you won't. Within a year he's gone. Sadly. People are still wondering about everything he said and all the promises he made. Beautiful, wonderful face on it. Glorious worship. Magnificent man of God. Lie. That's all it is, lie. Unstable in all his ways. And yet he had lots of money. Lots of money from many different places. He was able to use it in lots of different ways. And sadly, to this day, it's not accomplished. It's just money that was thrown into projects that nothing else was done. And the money's gone. Nothing was accomplished. Oh, the people were entertained for a while because looking at the flower of the grass looks great on the outside until the tough times come. So you see, poor minister to poor and needy to need, the scripture says. Blessed is the man of low estate for he knows and he looks and he sees and he grows and he just humbles himself to say, God, it's going to be tough. It's going to be rough. But you brought me this far and you've always brought me through. And I know what you're going to do. You're going to take me the rest of the way. Don't seek to be rich. Don't seek to be mighty. Don't seek to be great. Just accept whatever God gives you. 
And you may never know how wonderful and how powerful and how great you are because in your lowest state, God decided to lift up you higher and higher and higher and to make you great as shining as stars in the firmaments at night. Basking in the brightness of your light that's in the darkness of this world because that's where you're put. That's where you are. That's what God wants you to be. In the worst of times, you are the best of times. At the worst that you could be, you're clinging to your faith. That's where God wants you to be. Because He can move the mountains. He can move the oceans. He can bring in the tide. He can flood you with miraculous power and supernatural visages of things that you never knew existed all around you. And He can deliver you at a moment in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> and it is so awesome to see that you'll be a witness of that for eternity. Because you didn't depend upon your strength. You didn't depend upon your guns. You didn't go out and get an alarm system. You didn't go out and have to worry about, oh, the gang's going to get me. Ooh, they're going to kill me. Ooh, I got hit on the right cheek. Oh, I got hit on the left. Oh, no, I got left and right. Boom, uppercut. Ah, I'm knocked out. Oh, no, I'm dying. Oh, no, the law's coming to get me. They got me tied up. They got me bound up. What can I do? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For neither height nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things above or things below. Nothing here on earth, nothing from the left or the right. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And it's a promise by God that he said, I love you. Nothing can change that. Nothing will change that. You are mine. Deal with it. So, rejoice if you are of low estate, especially now, in these latter days, in these seasons that people get all excited about having money to spend, you know, spend the money, because you always got somebody on the other end going, yeah, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, spendy, 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 yeah, I want my Christmas presents, I want my New Year's presents, I want my birthday presents, I want my presents, 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 presents. You know, I'll take one presence, and that's the Holy Spirit inside of me humbly touching me in the times where I'm so weak and I'm so distraught and I'm going, God, I'm blown it. Again, would you forgive me? Please? And God says, oh, done. I love you. Haven't you figured that out yet? I just love you. And then you can sing of his love forever and ever. Because you know, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And that's all you need is to love him. It's the answer to all your trials and your tribulations. If you really love him, you're going to talk to him. And if you really love him, you're going to walk with him. And if you really love him, you're going to follow him. And when you don't, you're going to find out he really loves you. He really does.